lied to you guys last week. We are not going to be done today. <laughs> I, I'm going to want to make a promise. I don't, I don't want to say I'll promise we'll be done next, next, uh, next Sunday. But um, as I was kind of going down through, and we're going to read some of, some of these, uh, these verses from God's Word this morning, it just really, I feel, I feel like the Lord challenged me to get back into a couple points that I want to talk about uh, this morning. So if you guys are visiting with us this morning, we've been talking about this idea of being rooted in Christ based out of Colossians uh, chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, what it looks like to be grounded in Him. And you'll see the slide up there. There's all kinds of stuff going on in that slide. We talked about abiding, what abiding looks like in Jesus. Spend some time in John 15, 1 through 17, specifically 1 through 8. Always encourage you to read that section. It's, it's just an awesome place where Christ talks about what it looks like to abide in him. And then obviously fruit being produced from our lives. And we talked about the church in Philadelphia, Revelation 3. Um, you know, the things that Jesus noted, positive things that he noted about that church, and no rebuke, no correction for them. You know, obviously the Church of Philadelphia would be a, a gathering of believers that we would want to emulate or, or, or look more like, you know. Uh, so we talked about some of those things that he found in uh, uh, that church. But what I want to talk about this morning, like I said, we might finish hopefully next, next Sunday, is this idea of what it looks like uh, to be rooted. And we're going to spend a little bit of time in the book of Colossians where that word comes from. Uh, but I want to start in Psalm chapter 1. Because these words that Paul uses when he writes to the church in Colossae, this idea of being rooted or abiding, established in the faith, uh, speaks about a life that is rooted down in Christ. That when we're abiding in him and his words abide in us, as Jesus says in John 15, you know, that we bring much glory to the Father as we bear, uh, he says, much fruit. But as I was thinking about this, this idea of being rooted and what it looks like, Psalm 1 came into my mind. So I want to read that this morning. Just the first six verses uh, as the psalmist begins that psalm. Obviously, several people writing uh, the whole thing. But, and then we're going to jump into Psalm 119 and then eventually get into the, to this letter that Paul writes to the church there in Colossae. So Psalm 1, chapter 1, starting in verse 1 down through 6. And then I'll give you guys a little bit of time if you want to flip over to Psalm 119. Like I said, those uh, verses will be on the slide. But listen to what the psalmist says. And some of your translation is going to use the word blessed. Oh, how blessed are Oh, the joys or the blessedness of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with mockers. So here's the contrast to the kind of the negative of this. Uh, he says this in verse 2, but. but they, so these people that have this blessed or this joyous life filled with great joys, filled with blessings, it says, but they delight, they delight in the law of the Lord. Now, as I was studying that and just kind of looking at that, I, I got hung up on that word delight. I've been actually thinking about that word a good bit this past week, you know, this idea of delighting in, in, in the Lord. I don't know Hebrew, so I had to go in and use some helps to figure out what that word means in the Hebrew. And as I began to study it out, and it just kind of was showing me some different things, and I believe it will be on the screen, kind of the definition behind the word, this idea of delighting, of finding pleasure in longing for, you know, it's kind of the purpose of your life. You, you love God's Word, but they delight, they long for, they take pleasure in and the law of the Lord, referring to the Word of God. This is where this delight comes from, or this, this life of joy, or this life of blessedness. It says meditating on it, meditating on God's Word, day and night. And so he's going to give a description now. They, these folks that he's talking about, the ones of the blessed life, they are like, he's going to give something here, he's going to show us what it looks like to have the blessed life, this joyous life. They are like trees planted, the idea is rooted, planted or rooted along the riverbank, bearing fruit, we've been talking about that, John 15, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do, but not the wicked. These are the folks that do not delight in the God's Word. These are people that are outside the things of God, but not the wicked. They are like worthless shaft, scattered by the wind. They will be condemned at the time of judgment. Sinners will have no place among the godly or among the righteous. That word can be translated. For the Lord watches over the path of the godly or the righteous. But the path of the wicked leads to destruction. So we see here as the writer opens up this psalm, where does the blessed life come from? How, how does this life, this life that he talked about, oh, the joys of those that do these things, where does that life come from? What do we hear? And so for you guys who are visiting with, I encourage dialogue. I'm, I'm going to say this probably for months. I, mean, I see new faces. I encourage dialogue on Sunday mornings. I think it's the best way, one of the best ways to learn. So how do, how do we have that joyous life or that blessed life that's blessed of the Lord? Christ is our Savior. Now we're going to get to that, being rooted in Christ, having the blessed life when, when the Lord is our Savior, and He's also our Lord, which means what? Lord, lordship always means what, usually? Obedience. 
obedience to him and his ways. What does the psalmist say here that the blessed life comes from? There, I'm glad you didn't leave that second part out. <laughs> Nancy said, reading the word and applying it. You know, we've used this term here, a learning and living, that is studying, learning God's word, and then putting it into practice. Allowing God's word uh, to guide our lives. We know in James 1.22 uh, that James says this, that, that we can actually live in a level of deception if we just simply are hearers of the word but not doers of the word. He says you deceive yourself when you just simply, you know, you look at the screen this morning, I, I look at this, I, I'm susceptible to it as well, just reading and trying to put together a good Bible study or a, a study on Sunday morning, coming up with points, I can do it all. I can come up with points and just simply teach points and have no effect personal effect on my life. And, and what the psalmist says here is the one, like Nancy said, who reads God's word and then puts it into practice. You know, how do I, how do, I do this? But take notice what he says. He says, meditating on it day and night. It's this idea of constant uh, or constant time in God's word, spending time in God's word. You know, for you guys that know Clark that has been here with us a number of times, one of the things that he encourages us in is to kind of run with a word. I, I ran with delight this week. Where else does that word show up in the, in the Bible? And you, you begin to look at that, you know, and this is the things that I've come across, this idea of being rooted, grounded, enjoying the blessed life from God, always comes from, through obedience. Putting God's word into practice, being obedient to his word, meditating on it. And so we, wouldn't, we don't know how to have the blessed life or the joyous life if we don't know God's word. And that's why he instructs us to meditate on it, what, 20 minutes in the morning? And there's nothing wrong with that. I do devotionals too. There we go. There we go, Jim. Jim. Jim's really good at cooking pork butts. Can you say butt in church? <clears throat> I, guess, I guess you can. I just said it, whatever. So, yeah, Jim's a great barbecue. Yeah, just, I mean, to, to marinate in God's word, to have his word kind of permeate in and through you. You know, and, and a lot of times, and we talked about this in John, oh boy, John chapter 5, I think, 39 and 40, where Jesus condemned the religious leaders. They knew a lot about God's word, experts in it. But they missed him. He says, you, you know, you, you search the scriptures thinking that you have eternal life in them. He's like, but the scriptures point to me, but you refuse to come to me. So we can know God's word, but if we're not coming to Christ, like Erica said, if I've not been born again, if I don't know Jesus, if I'm just simply going in to study God's word just for knowledge or information instead of transformation, if I'm not being transformed, uh, it's a pointless study. It's a pointless study. You know, how is it that, like she said, how is it that I can simply marinate in God's Word? How can I spend time in it? You know, the things that maybe I study out in the mornings, like as I was studying this word delight, I was thinking about it through my week. Do I really delight? Do I long for it? Do I pursue? Do I, you know, do I have a love for God's Word in my life? Do I have that kind of a delight? And when you do, what happens is always going to lead you to obedience and living a life that... Um, is what he says here is bearing fruit. He likens it to a tree that's planted, rooted down, where he's getting his nutrients. And so for me, my, my mind pictures that John 15, you know, the branches abiding in the vine. When we're connected to Christ and his word is abiding in us, we can ask the Father. He gives us the things that we want. And we couple that along with First John chapter 5, uh, 14 and 15, I believe it is, you know, when we pray according to his will. That's just how we know the will of God, by spending time in his word, knowing how to pray and then all of a sudden, that blessed life, that joyous life, is what the psalmist is saying begins to come. What's one of the, so we looked at the negative in Psalm 1, 1. Why do you think the psalmist says that those that um, follow the advice of the wicked stand around with sinners or join in with mockers, the blessed life won't come from that kind of activity? Who has ever been around some knuckleheads? That's not a biblical term, I don't think. I've been, I've been a knucklehead at times. <laughs> I've been around him at times. What's Paul say? Bad company corrupts what? Good morals or good intention. Your circle matters. You'll hear me say that often. Who you uh, kind of allow... I'm not saying we, we, we don't want... We, we want people in our lives and we want to be in other people's lives, but those that have the greatest influence in your life, they need to be some really good people. Not just simply good, they need to know Christ. And I think the Psalm of David says in Psalm 119, I basically delight in those that love your law. I, my, my closest friends are those that love your law. You know, that's why we gather on Sunday mornings. You know, I call this a believer's gathering. We come here to worship Christ. We come here uh, to get into his word. Uh, you know, the Bible t really tells me, Paul tells me in Ephesians 4, that I am, my responsibility is to equip the saints for the work of ministry, that we might be edified, growing together, growing numerically as well. 
for the acts for the works of ministry. And so it's important who you're around. And, and what he says here, the blessed life of this joyous life will not come if you're hanging around wicked people. People that are just, they're walking in their sin. They have no interest. And that's not saying, because we who here knows we still sin? Because if we don't, well, what does John say in 1 John? Then we make God a liar. We still sin. His heart is, when he writes in 1 John 2, is that no one sins. But if we sin, that is, we do sin. We have a propiti- propitiation. It's Christ who is the propitiation before God. But his, God's heart towards us is that we don't have a practice of sin. But these folks are want people that just dive head on into sin. They join in, they mock, and they whatever. And when you're around people like that, over time you become like that. Who here knows that you become kind of like the people who's closest in your life, who's closest in your life. Because Christ has, has done a work in all of our lives, you know, we, we should be rubbing shoulders with other folks. You know, the reason why I'm at where I'm at today is because I rubbed shoulders for a short period of time when I came to know Christ with somebody that was different than me. He delighted in the law of the Lord. Tracy and I saw that, and we came to know Christ through his witness, and really just through the words that he had to say. So the blessed life comes through obedience or meditating day and night on the word of God. Now, Psalm 119, if you want to flip over there. We studied... Not the whole psalm, that's a long psalm, 176 verses, but we studied a good part of that the psalm uh, months ago. If you know Psalm 119, the longest, really the longest chapter in the Bible, 176 verses, all but maybe two or three of those verses talk um, directly about the love of God's Word, the God's Word in your life, what it does for you if you put it into practice and you love it. Psalm 119, as he begins this psalm, listen to what is said. It's kind of almost similar to the very beginning there in Psalm 1. Psalm 119, starting in 1, and we'll look at 8 verses. It says, joyful. Here we go again, that word blessed. Oh, how blessed. Oh, how joyful are people of integrity. Now listen to the, these, this idea of obedience, these action words. Who follow. They follow the instructions of the Lord. Joyful, or how blessed are those who obey His laws. It's God's word. And search for Him with all their hearts. They do not compromise with evil, and they walk the way that they live their lives only in His paths. Not our paths, but His paths. You have charged us to keep your commandments carefully. Oh, that my actions would consistently reflect your decrees. That I will not be ashamed when I compare my life with your commands. You ever just take your life and run it next to God's Word? That can be a scary thing. That can be a scary thing. But when we do that, when we begin to... And that's what the psalmist says. When we take, we take our lives and we run them according to God's Word, what does God's Word say about how I should live my lives? You know, when you, stu- when, my life, when you study God's Word, um, I don't know that there's not a single thing that we experience or go through in life that isn't spoken about in God's Word. Everything from finances, how we deal with money, loans. I mean, go, spend some time in the Proverbs. Just every, relationships, jobs... Husband and wife, kids to, you know, parents, parents to kids. I mean, there's so much that God's Word says in there. And when we line our lives up and we're obedient to it, what happens is that joyful life that the psalmist here says in Psalm 119.1 comes, the blessed life, because now we're walking in integrity. We're following, we're obeying the things of the Lord when we compare our lives against God's Word. Verse 7 says, as I learn your righteous regulations. So there's this idea of growing in God's grace. You know, Peter, when he concludes his letter in 2 Peter 3.18, says to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Christ. You know, the things that I know today are completely different than the things that I knew 20 years ago or 15 years ago or 10 years ago. You know, one of the problems that, you know, I've talked about this is when I came to know Christ um, March of 1998, um, I had an anger issue. I had, just, I had issues with anger. Um, and I was, so I come to know Christ. I was saved. I mean, it's a definite one of those born-again types of, he did this work in my life. My life was radically changed, but he didn't take anger out of my life for a couple years. He, did, he, took, he took profanity out of my life instantly. And Tracy, be witness to that. I had a foul mouth before I came to know Christ. Foul. But he didn't take anger. And so as I begin to grow, and this idea of, uh, as I learn your righteous regulations, I spent time in God's Word and I began to look at this idea of anger because I didn't like it. And so what I would do is I would tuck, I, I would write on index cards verses about anger and I put them in my pockets. And as I, you know, who knows when you get angry, it kind of starts here. Something makes you angry, and it's like, mm. and then all of a sudden, if you don't, if you don't check it, it starts to build, and it starts to build, and it gets in here, and then it comes out there, or here, or however you're, you know, 
And when that would happen, I would begin to recognize that, and I'd pull the card out. It's not like some magical thing, but I'd pull God's Word out, and I'd meditate on what it, God's Word. It would be all kinds of different verses about anger. And what happened was, as I learned your righteous regulations there, verse 7, as I began to learn the things of God's Word, and this idea of having that, joy, that joyous life or that blessed life, God's Word began to cleanse me and wash me. Ephesians 5 talks about that. It began to change my life. And I, I had a heart. I had a delight in God's Word. And I would, over time, God began to work those things out. And once He kind of got that worked out, and I'm not so perfect in that, um, He began to work on other things in my life. I learned your righteous regulations. Now listen, I will thank you by, this is how we thank God, I will thank you by living as I should. I will obey your decrees and here we go. Please don't give up on me. You know, when you read Psalm 119, and many people believe that's King David writing that long psalm, I mean, you, you, you see his highs or you hear his highs and lows through that psalm. You know, he loves God's Word and, and he knows it's God's Word that directs his life. And then in a couple verses later, he's like, oh, I'm down in the da- ashes. I'm down in the dust. My bones are broken. I'm in, uh, dep- depressed and there's anxiety on my life. And, and where are you, God? Oh, but I trust in your Word. And he's, he's, that's why I love God's Word. Because it's honest. King David is honest. You know, uh, Acts 13 says that what? King David was a man after what? God's own heart. And he struggled. We know that the rest of his story. But in Hebrews 11, no mention of sin because he trusted in God. He knew that God's Word was the thing that would instruct his life, that would give his life this joy, this, this blessed life that he was longing for. That's why he said, you know, please don't give up on me. I'm a work in progress. Who, who knows the work that he has begun in us? He will continue that work till the day of Christ, Paul says. He will continue the work that he started. So don't give up. God's not giving up. We can't give up. And we're going to eventually talk about perseverance as the fifth point next Sunday, persevering all the way to the end. So I wanted to start with Psalm chapter 1, looking at a couple verses in Psalm 119, just this love, and we're going to talk briefly this morning about the love that we should have uh, for the Word of God. So Colossians chapter 1, so if you've got your finger there, flip over to Colossians. Like I said, these will be on the screen as well. We've spent some time in this Rooted series looking at this letter that Paul wrote to this church that he did not know. He did not know this church personally, but he still had a love for the church universal. We sit here blessed this morning to have this letter. Colossians chapter 1. What I want to do is, and I'm just, for me, I went through all four chapters and I looked at the highlights. For me, things, and there's the whole, the whole letter's great. Just read all four chapters. The things that really, for time's sake, stuck out to me, I'm going to look in each, we're going to look in each chapter. You know, as I've talked about here, as we've been talking about this Ruta series, if I've made a reference to this letter that he wrote to the uh, folks there in, uh, in Colossae, um, I, I don't think that there's a, another letter or at least a written defense that we have in God's Word than this, than this letter that he writes to this church in defense of who Jesus is. I mean, Hebrews is pretty good. talks about you know, Jesus being our high priest and who Christ is. And you read Hebrews 1, uh, the supremacy of Jesus. But here Paul really specifically addresses this church, and, and many believe that because a lot of heresy was creeping in to their midst, a lot of different false teachings, people were presenting a different Jesus. They were saying some things about Jesus and then adding their own little swing about him. And you can see that in Colossians chapters 1 and 2. Now he gives more practical advice in the last two chapters of how we're to live. The same thing he does in Ephesians. But I don't think there's a a better written defense that we have right here as the Apostle Paul is writing to this church and for us today about who Jesus is. You know, who here knows that trusting and believing in following the right Jesus is vitally important? Who here knows that there's also a lot of Jesuses that are spoke about in churches that may not be the right Jesus? The right Jesus. And if you want to know who Christ is, I mean, spend some time in the Gospels. Spend some time, obviously, reading through these letters, but we have to know who Christ, who the real Jesus is, because Jesus warned us about it, Paul warns us about it, Peter warns us about it, Jude warns us about it, you know, that we're to defend the faith, there are going to be people that are going to present a different Jesus to you. Paul, when he writes to the churches, a region of churches in, in, in Galatia, the book of Galatians, he does the same thing. You know, I can't believe you guys have moved so quick from the gospel, I'm believing something other that's crazy. So we see this defense that he has, this idea of being rooted in the right Jesus, abiding with the right Jesus. So Colossians chapter 1, starting at verse 4, we're going to look at 4 and 6 and 9 and 10 out of chapter 1. So he addresses his church, and this is what he says. He says, we heard of your faith. 
So Paul's writing from a distance about these Christians in this town of Colossae. They heard about their faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all the saints because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before uh, in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you. So he's making a reference to them uh, when they initially came to know Jesus Christ. And if you study Acts, you'll know that in Acts 19, when Paul was ministering in the church in Ephesus, in Acts 19.10 specifically, that the word of the Lord rang forth from the church there in Ephesus to all of us as Asians. And most likely, uh, the believers here uh, in this town, uh, that's where their faith came from, from folks that we don't really know um, that went, took the message of Christ, the gospel of Christ, into this city. So it's, it has come to you as it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit, and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. Now verse 9, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will, God's will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And so we hear Paul's heart to these folks that are in this town of Colossae, this church, this letter, that his heart towards them is that they were going to be walking worthy of, of the Lord, pleasing Him, producing fruit in their lives. Remember how, how does that fruit come? How do we produce fruit in our lives? Abiding in Christ. Abiding in Jesus. You know, sometimes... Um, when, when you think of fruit, and I think Nancy brought this up a couple of years ago, or a couple of years ago, good night, my memory's not that good, um, a couple of Sundays ago, when you think of fruit, many times you think of reproducing into people, lives. And you kind of get, you kind of hear that here in Colossians chapter 1, that, that he considered uh, at some level the folks that were in this church his fruit. So if you go back to Acts 19, you see him ministering in Ephesus. He was there for almost three years, ministering the Word of God to them. We know that in Acts 20 that he called the elders there, uh, talking about just staying true to Christ, watching out for their ministry and watching out for the flock there. And so the Word of the Lord went forth there, and his heart for them was that they would produce more fruit. And we're going to talk more about this next Sunday, because we, last Sunday we talked about the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of holiness that should be in our lives. But also, uh, you know, as you study the Scripture... Uh, um, what was the last command that Jesus gave before he went back to be with the Father? The well, very last command that he gave. Go. Go into the world. Go into the world, make disciples, teaching them to observe or to be obedient. We, we, we've listened to this here. You know, Psalm 119, as I learn your righteous regulations, we're to go and to teach people the, the things of the Word of God. We're to take the Gospel to them. If you look at Mark 16, you know, go into all the world and preach the gospel, preach the good news to all creation. Those that have believed, that believe the gospel and are baptized will be saved. Acts 1, go into all the world and be my witnesses. Be my witnesses. And so, obviously, that's a command. That's the last command that was great commission that we've been given. So people, obviously, are important to God. They should be important to us. And so we sense that here as we're looking at this letter, that these people are considered, Paul considers them at some level, good fruit coming from the ministry that he did most likely from Ephesus. But we're to be fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, growing in the grace and knowledge. Colossians chapter 2. Let's jump into the second chapter. Highlight that sticks out to me here is this one. And we've looked at this verse 6 and 7 because it's the main verse that we've been talking about from that slide, walk, rooted, established, abounding in the faith. Colossians 2 starting in verse 10. I'm sorry, starting verse 6, 2.10, beginning of 10. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. Take note how many times Paul will make the reference in Him, in Christ. Rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith. As you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Here's one of the warnings that he gives us. He gives them really, but us too. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in Him, as Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in Him. 
So if you guys remember, when we, we, we started this study in the book of Colossae, uh, we kind of compared it a little bit to the book that, or the letter that Paul writes to uh, the church in Ephesus. Uh, we get, it's Ephesians. You know, when you study out Ephesians, specifically I think the first two chapters, maybe into the, to the third chapter, Paul will make a, a, you know, he'll always talk about Christ in us. And what does it look like that Christ is living in our lives? And, you know, there's all kinds of things he talked about, about inheriting things, the blessed life. In Ephesians, in in the book that he writes here, that we have here is Colossians, he talks about us in Christ, being in Christ. What does it look like to actually be in him, in the vine, established in the faith, rooted down in Christ, uh, walking in Christ, established this idea of a foundation in Christ, and it all comes by way of what? Being taught God's Word. You know, you guys know, I think from the very very beginning since I've been here, like, um, that's really all I got. I don't have a lot of opinions or funny stories, and sometimes I'll use silly things, but um, I don't have nothing but God's Word. I am completely convinced, sold out for the teaching of the, of the Word of God, really verse by verse, chapter by chapter. That's the best way within context to teach God's Word, but, but you'll always see God's Word. Very rarely do you see any other things that I'll put there on the screen. It's God's Word has the power to do these things that we're talking about as we're being taught, abounding in it, with thanksgiving. And the more that we know God's Word, the more, or at least the ability we'll have to recognize these people that Paul warns us against, false teachers, people that present a different Jesus. You remember, I think I've used this quote before, Charles Spurgeon uh, said that um, um, discernment isn't the difference between right and wrong. Discernment is the difference between right and what? Almost right. We can pick wrong out. Just go, you know, that's 100%. You see counterfeit, you see false, you know instantly if you know just a little bit of God's Word, you know a little bit about who Jesus is, somebody comes presenting something to you, but the one, the one that is the most dangerous that comes with about a 75% truth. And the rest is just simply watered down. Now, I've joked about this before, it's not really a joke for the person drinking it. How does, how does a wife kill, his, kill her husband in the morning with coffee? One teaspoon of antifreeze at a time. And that's what I think I've heard people do. They drop a teaspoon of antifreeze in the coffee. You can't detect it. You drink it down and it starts doing crazy things to your kidneys. That's what false teachers do. They give you a little bit of antifreeze along with the coffee. And it tastes like decent coffee. But when you know real coffee, you'll detect it. You should be able to detect it. And that's what we have here in God's Word. What is it about who Christ is? What does it look like to be rooted? What does it look like to really know the Jesus of Scripture? Know the Jesus that God speaks about? God speaks about, rooted and built up in Him, Christ. Colossians chapter 3, highlight out of this chapter. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, and the the beginning of 16, then into 17 a little bit. If, 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 if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, Where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. What happens when you set your mind on the things of the earth? Or or your focus becomes the things of the earth primarily. I saw a hand motion over there. I think I I know what the hand motion meant. You're given over to them. Is that what it meant? Yeah, there we go. Another one. Left field. You go off in left field. Did I call on you or did you have a question? Okay. I won't point to nobody here unless you want to be pointed at. (laughs) Yeah, when we think about these things, actually I wrote something on Facebook this morning. I was doing my own little study. It had nothing to do with this morning, just my own personal study. I was in first. I love First John. I'm always in there reading it. First John two. John says, "The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of this world. They're all passing away. But he who does the will of God abides forever." The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the very things in Genesis three. If you read them out, the very play game or the game play that uh, the playbook that uh, the devil, the Satan, had whenever he was tempting Christ and de- in in, we went off into the desert. The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So what he did with Eve started the whole mess. The devil's game plan isn't that sophisticated. 
I'm not saying he's nobody to toy with if you're not in Christ. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life will do more damage to your walk than anything else. When you're pursuing after the things of the world, like you go off into left field. When we keep our mind focused on the things above, when we keep our, our so set your mind on those things, the things that will last, where your treasure is, there is your heart also. Where do you store your treasures at? If, if your focus is here, if your focus is, is, is acute, my mom used to always say that you never see a U-Haul in the back of a hearse. You're not taking nothing out of here. You're not, it's, everybody else is going to get your stuff. No matter investment, retirement plans, money, homes, furniture, cars. When you check out, it doesn't go with you. But what does go with us or what we follow are those things that we store up. Jesus said that in the Sermon on the Mount. Those things that we store up into heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy, where thief can't break in to steal. Where your heart is, or where your treasure is, where, is where your heart is at. Keep our minds focused on those things. You know, Clark Robinson often says, does these world's goods, or does these world's good, the goods of the world, have you, or do you have them? What are you possessed by? Are you possessed by Christ, or is your concern more about the temporary? That's what he's saying. You set your mind on the things about the things that will never go away. Because when you begin to do those things, and if you're, and we already looked at this, this idea of, of, of walking with the right people, having right counsel, having right circles in your life, when you have, when you're around people that are thinking the same way, you'll have a loose grip on stuff. So when the stuff leaves, or you lose the stuff, or you know, the housing market gets destroyed in 2008. And you lose. I, I knew a guy that lost a half a million dollars. But he wasn't a believer. And he almost committed suicide. I don't want to lose stuff either, but if, if my, my, my heart and my focus is on the things of Christ that does not go away, I won't be moved so much by the temporary things when they go away. When they go away. Verse 16 of Colossians 3. Let the word of Christ, let. If you circle your Bibles, circle that word let. Doesn't, he doesn't just simply say in verse 16, the words of Christ will dwell in you richly. And I don't have them all on the screen. It's psalms and spiritual songs and hands. He goes on and talks about some things there. But he says, let it. Allow it. Let the word of Christ, let God's word dwell in you. It's that idea of having a, de- a delight in the law of the Lord. I meditate on it day and night. It's a part of who I am. I love God's word. It's dwelling in me richly. Allow it to happen. Spend time in it. Verse 17, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. You know, it's what Jesus concluded in that section we was looking at, not the whole thing, but in John chapter 15 and verse 8. You know, whenever we're abiding in the vine and producing fruit and our prayer life looks like it should and we love God's Word and we love Christ and all this stuff is going on, it brings glory to the Father that we bear much fruit. And he eventually say, fruit that actually remains. Not temporary fruit, but fruit that will last all the way to eternity. This is what he says here in Colossians 3. We do all things of the, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him, bringing all the glory to God. In the last chapter there in Colossians chapter 4, listen to the instruction that Paul gives us on how we are to kind of win fruit over, produce fruit in our lives. And this fruit that he's talking about here specifically um, is the, li- the lives of others. The people are coming to faith in Christ. Colossians 4, 5, and 6, and then the very end of it, close to the end of it, verse 16. He says, live wisely. Live wisely among those who are not believers. And make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have, or let your conversation be seasoned with salt. Some of the translations will say, gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response. Not just simply a response to everyone, but the correct one, the right response. You know, we've looked at this verse, First um, Peter 3.15, at length here. Sanctify Christ as Lord of your lives. And when they look at your life, they see the things that you're, that you're about. You know, not stress-free, not anxiety-free, not, you know, you're honest in your will with them, but you have a real walk with Christ. And so when the crazy times come, when the storms come, the found, you're grounded on Christ. It's the last thing Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount. You go nowhere. They begin to see those things in your life. What does it say? When we have sanctified Christ as Lord of our lives, and they, they ask you for a response, or they ask you for a defense, for the hope that you have, always be ready to give it in gentleness and respect. Meekness. Talking to them about the things of Christ. That's what Paul says here. Let your response be right for everyone. Make the most of every opportunity. Be gracious so that it's attractive. So that it's attractive. And he kind of brings this letter to a close there in verse 16. 
It says, and, have you, and, have you, and you have read this letter. After you've read this letter, pass it on to the church. At La- I don't know if it got to Laodicea, to be honest with you. Who, who knows the story of Laodicea, Revelation 3? They may have been a very healthy church at some point, but it says, pass it on to the church in Laodicea so they can read it too, and you should read the letter I wrote to them. And so there's an unknown letter, and Paul wrote a lot of letters, this one here has just been inspired by God's Holy Spirit, the Colossians. There was a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Laodicea. And so the instruction was for them to have that letter read to them. We don't know nothing about the, the letter. It's interesting, he says, to pass it on to the church of Laodicea. And like I said, if we understand the book of Colossians, we know that Paul is making a written defense of the preeminence, the importance of Christ. Who knows what the rebuke was for the church of Laodicea? It had a couple, actually, but some tough words Jesus had to say. You remember? You make me, you make me, what? You want to sit. <laughs> Jesus looks at the church, he's just like, you need to get that. Mm. You make me sick. You make me sick. You think you got everything. That's what he says. I'm just going to paraphrase. You think you got everything going on. You know, you think you're rich. You think you are needed nothing. You think you could do it all without me. You don't even know me. Jesus, is, remember that's the one where he's knocking, asking for entrance? He's on the outside of that church. He said, but you, need to, you need to get my counsel. You need to buy from me. You need to have eye, you salve to open your eyes to see the truth. Did this letter get there? I don't know. I know this letter was written about three decades prior to the letter or, or the book of Revelation was written. Maybe the, maybe the church in Laodicea was, was a decent church. The one thing that I, uh, and I'm going to jump into two points and then we're going to end. The one thing I want to note is I was kind of just considering verse 16. Read the letter I wrote to them. Well, we don't have the church. We don't have that letter. We don't have Laodicea or their, whatever that letter would be called. As I was thinking about that, I was like, what benefit? I mean, God knowing all things and the Holy Spirit inspiring, you know, Paul and Peter and Jude and others to write, James. What's up with this letter? Why was, why was it a letter that was uh, to be encouraged to be read in the church? As I was thinking about it, you guys know I like Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon one time said, visit many good books, but live in the Bible. And when Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, um, he's just given all kinds of instructions. Um, and he tells Timothy, you know what, to bring the books and the parchments, especially the parchments is what he, parchments is what he says. You know, many believe that to believe. I believe the parchment is referring to God's word. Maybe it was sections of Isaiah. I don't know what it was. But he says the books. The books are just extra writing. It could be commentary by great rabbis. I don't know. And so there's nothing wrong with re- who here likes to read books other than the Bible. And it's okay to raise your hand. I have reading lists. I have books I read right now. There's, you know, I like to read R.A. Torrey. I read a lot of older writers. I'm reading John, Mac- some Mac- John MacArthur right now on truth. There's nothing wrong with reading other books. But the problem happens sometimes within Christianity, Christian circles, is that we, we turn Charles Spurgeon's quote around and we, we live in books and only visit the Bible. He says, visit many good, and he, I mean, I'm sure he used his words carefully, he says good books, not good books. Visit many good books, he says, but live in the Bible. When we live in the Bible know God's word, then we have something to guard ourselves when we read uninspired writing. Beneficial writing, but uninspired writing. You know, I have, over the course of many years, have put away a lot of authors. I've put away a lot of authors who, over time, begin to change the, I mean, important major theology thoughts. I can't read that guy no more. I'm not going to read it. You know, John MacArthur at some point might go south. I don't know. I hope not. I think he won't. But read many a good book. That's what I see here. There's this idea of reading the Bible. So I want to spend two just a couple minutes in these two points, this idea of being rooted, Colossians 2, 6, and 7. We've already hit this, these two points, more at length, I think, when we were talking about the abiding, John 15. We're going to look at two things, God's Word and the preeminence of Jesus Christ. Remember, that was what Jesus commended the church in Philadelphia for. You have not denied my name, and you've kept my word, is what he says. When I look in at you guys, you have not denied my name. That means that, that they were following Christ. Jesus was the focus and pursuit of their life, the preeminence of Christ. They would be able to agree with what Paul says in Colossians 1 and 2, a love for Jesus, pursuit of Jesus, and God's word. And because of that, he says, I'm going to open up a door for you. When you study that out, 
what I believe Christ is talking about is I'm going to give you the opportunity for evangelism. You're going to be able to take the gospel out. So God's word and the preeminence of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to look at a couple different verses than what we looked at when we were talking about the abiding part of this. Colossians chapter 1, we've already looked at the beginning of this. A couple places here in Colossians. Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of truth of the gospel. That's God's word. Chapter 3, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And then chapter 4, after you have read this letter, pass it on. The importance of God's word, the importance of having that delight in God's word. You want to have that life that is full of joy, that is a blessed life. You have to meditate that God's word is a part of you. And Peter says it this way in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23, the importance of God's word and what it does. He says, since you have been born again, John 3, 3 and 3, 7, you must be born again, Jesus says, to enter heaven. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. You see, when we delight, when we long for God's Word, when we meditate on it day and night, we're like that, plea, that, that tree that is planted next to the riverbank, producing fruit, a blessed life, when we love God's Word. Number two, the preeminence of Christ. To be rooted, you have to have that idea. I, I, Christ is the focus and the greatest pursuit of my life. Acts chapter 4, 11 through 13. Listen to Peter's statement referring to Jesus, talking about Jesus. This is after him and John were arrested where God healed the lame man at the beginning of Acts. Listen to what Christ or what Peter has to say about Christ. For Jesus is the one referred to in the Scriptures when it says the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. Colossians 2. That's what we are being built up on, that foundation of Christ. He is the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. There is salvation. You cannot be saved. You're not going to be in a route to heaven outside of Christ. A walking Born-again relationship with Jesus is what Peter is saying. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. No other name, no other system, no other religion, no other way. That kind of talking one day probably will get me arrested. There's no other way. I didn't make it up. I'm just, don't kill the messenger. That's why I tell people, don't kill me. Just telling you what it says. And I believe it, and I know the power that it has. The members of the council were amazed, it says, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the Scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. If someone's going to accuse you of anything in this life, let that be the accusation. Don't like what Eric is doing, but yeah, she's been with Jesus. Amen. I'm glad. That was the act. I mean, to them, they were making an accusation. They were almost poking fun. You could tell that these people had been with that guy. Caused all kinds of... We, we killed him. But what I see here is a positive. Uh, there's going to be a... I don't have it on my notes, but there's a Tozer quote. I don't know if you guys read it up there. The thing that's closest to your heart is what you talk about. And if God is closest to your heart, you'll talk about him. What are you known for when you speak? Is God closest? See, we see this. Christ was closest to Peter's heart. This is what he spoke about. We know the rest of the story of this chapter is he went out speaking more boldly the word of God. The things about Christ. didn't care that he was threatened after that arrest. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2. Listen to Paul's statement about Jesus when he writes to the church in Corinth. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified greatest pursuit of Paul's life. And we've looked at this section in length. Philippians chapter 3, 8, in the beginning of 9, and then 10. Listen to what Paul has to say about his greatest pursuit in life. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage or as dung, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. Verse 10, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised Him from the dead. I want to suffer with Him, sharing in His death. What was Paul's greatest pursuit? Christ. I want to know Christ. What do you think that word know means? There we go. <laughs> Who here knows? Well, I, I'll just speak for myself. For, for the first some 30 years of my life, I knew some things about Jesus. My father was a preacher before he passed. My mother, godly woman, I've shared the story a thousand times. 
went to church my whole life, went to youth group my whole life, could tell you all kinds of Jesus stories, had all kinds of Bibles. Actually, it's a joke in our life, in our, in our family. Then I went to Korea in the army. I wasn't a believer then, uh, but I knew some things about Jesus. So what I did is I went to the local bookstore and bought a, a Bible and had my name um, inscribed or whatever, in gold le- engraved there in gold letters, thinking that if I took a engraved Bible with John M. Bartlett on the front to Korea, that life was going to go well for me. I knew enough. You think that Bible ever got opened in the year that I was stationed in Korea? That thing was a dust collector. I didn't care. I, I knew things about Jesus. I could tell. If you ask me stories, I could tell you some stories because I spent time in church. My dad, when he was alive, was huge on the. We had remember those little ceramic um, loaves of bread on the kitchen table. You popped the thing up, and you had little Bible verses that you pulled out. As you know, he died when I was five. So, but I, my mom would say even then, like the Bartlett's had a. For breakfast, I had to pull it and memorize it, and then I had to recite it to him the next morning for breakfast, and I had to get another card. My dad had a love for God's Word. And I read that and memorized it, but with just head knowledge. See, what Paul says here is that this infant value of knowing Christ, what James said, it's an intimate, personal relationship. It's an abiding, I'm remaining, I'm connected. I really want to know Him. When I open my Bible, it's like what she was saying, it, just, it, God's, it, it, it marinates me. <laughs> As, as, as God's Word just does that in my life, it's Paul's greatest pursuit. God's Word and Christ, the focus of Christ, I can promise you if you approach that the way that God will, will bless that, you'll be rooted in Christ. And when the storms of life come and whatever comes in life, you won't be moved. Next Sunday we're going to finish up the last three points because I'm going to talk about the Holy Spirit. Uh, a lot of churches don't like to talk about Him. They think He's some weird force or I don't know what they've defined Him as. My encouragement would simply be this. I, I put this out a couple Sundays ago. Um, between now and next Sunday, I strongly, 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 strongly encourage you to read John chapters 14 through 16. John chapter 14 through 16. You know, he starts that at the beginning, you know, the beginning of chapter 14, in my father's house for many minutes. You know, he kind of talks about that. And he, then he begins to talk about the work of the Holy Spirit, what the Spirit does. Obviously, John 15 that we went over is within that section, but I would encourage there's just three chapters. Spend some time in them. Then we're going to talk about the fourth point, bearing fruit. We've already talked about the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of holiness, walking in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, self-control, all that list. But we're going to talk more about the fruit of people, the importance of affecting and impacting the lives of people. And then the last point that we'll end on next Sunday is going to be perseverance. Remember, that was one of the things that he, uh, that he um, kind of padded the church there in Philadelphia on the back about in Revelation 3, because you've kept my command to persevere, I will keep you from the hour of trial that's coming on on the whole earth to, t- to try those that dwell on the earth. Perseverance, the importance of perseverance. Let's pray. Father.